Part three, burning bright. Lights flicked on and house doors opened all down the street to watch the carnival set up. Montag and Beatty stared, one with dry satisfaction, the other with disbelief, at the house before them, the main ring in which torches would be juggled and fire eaten. Well, said Beatty, now you did it. Old Montag wanted to fly near the sun, and now that he's burnt his damn wings, he wonders why. Didn't I hint enough when I sent the hound around your place? Montag's face was entirely numb and featureless. He felt his head turn like a stone carving to the dark place next door, set in its bright borders of flowers. Beatty snorted. Oh no, you weren't fooled by that little idiot's routine now, were you? Flowers, butterflies, leaves, sunsets, oh hell, it's all in her file, I'll be damned. I've hit the bullseye. Look at the sick look on your face. A few grass blades in the quarters of the moon? What trash. What good did she ever do with all that? Montag sat on the cold fender of the dragon, moving his head half an inch to the left, half an inch to the right, left, right, left, right, left. She saw everything. She didn't do anything to anyone. She just let them alone. Alone? Hell, she chewed around you, didn't she? One of those damn do-gooders with their shocked holier-than-thou silences, their one talent making others feel guilty. God damn, they rise like the midnight sun to sweat you in your bed. The front door opened. Mildred came down the steps, running one suitcase held with a dreamlike clinching rigidity in her fist as a beetle taxi hissed to the curb. Mildred! She ran past with her body stiff, her face flowered with powder, her mouth gone without lipstick. Mildred, you didn't put in the alarm. She shoved the valis in the waiting beetle, climbed in, and sat mumbling, poor family, poor family, oh, everything's gone, everything, everything gone now. Beanie grabbed Montag's shoulder as the beetle blasted away and hit 70 miles an hour, far down the street, gone. There was a crash like the falling parts of a dream fashioned out of warped glass, mirrors, and crystal prisms. Montag drifted about as if still another incomprehensible storm had turned him to see Stone Man and Black wielding axes, shattering window panes to provide cross ventilation. The brush of a death's head moth against a cold black screen. Montag, this is Faber. Do you hear me? What is happening? This is happening to me, said Montag. What a dreadful surprise, said Beatty. For everyone nowadays knows, absolutely is certain that nothing will ever happen to me. Others die, I go on. There are no consequences and no responsibilities except that there are. But let's not talk about them, eh? By the time the consequences catch up with you, it's too late, isn't it, Montag? Montag, can you get away? Run? asked Faber. Montag walked but did not feel his feet touch the cement and then the night grasses. Beatty flicked his igniter nearby, and the small orange flame drew his fascinated gaze. What is there about fire that's so lovely? No matter what age we are, what draws us to it? Beatty blew out the flame and lit it again. It's perpetual motion. The thing man wanted to invent but never did, or almost perpetual motion. If you let it go on, it'd burn our lifetimes out. What is fire? It's a mystery. Scientists give us gobbledygook about friction and molecules, but they don't really know. Its real beauty is that it destroys responsibility and consequences. A problem gets too burdensome, then into the furnace with it. Now, Montag, you're a burden. And fire will lift you off my shoulders. Clean, quick, sure. Nothing to rot later. Antibiotic, aesthetic, practical. Montag stood looking in now at this queer house made strange by the hour of the night, by murmuring neighbor voices, by littered glass, and there on the floor, their covers torn off and spilled out like swan feathers, the incredible books that looked so silly and really not worth bothering with, for these were nothing but black type and yellow paper and raveled binding. Mildred, of course, she must have watched him hide the books in the garden and brought them back in. Mildred, Mildred. I want you to do this job all by your lonesome, Montag, not with kerosene and a match, but piecework with a flamethrower. Your house, your cleanup. Montag, can't you run? Get away. 
No, cried Montag helplessly. The hound, because of the hound, Jaber heard, and Beebe, thinking it was meant for him, heard. Yes, the hound's somewhere about the neighborhood, so don't try anything. Ready? Ready. Montag snapped the safety catch from the flamethrower. Fire! A great nuzzling gout of flame leaped out to lap at the books and knock them against the wall. He stepped into the bedroom and fired twice, and the twin bed set up in great simmering whisper with more heat and passion and light than he would have supposed them to contain. He burnt the bedroom walls and the cosmetics chest because he wanted to change everything, the chairs, the tables, and in the dining room, the silverware and plastic dishes, everything that showed that he had lived here in this empty house with a strange woman who would forget him tomorrow, but gone and quite forgotten him already, listening to her seashell radio pour in on her and in on her as she rolled across town alone. And as before, it was good to burn. He felt himself gush out in the fire, snatch, rend, rip in half with flame, and put away the senseless problem. If there was no solution, well, then now there was no problem either. Fire was best for everything. The books, Montag. The books leaped and danced like roasted birds, their wings ablaze with red and yellow feathers. And then he came to the parlor where the great idiot monsters lay asleep with their white thoughts and their snowy dreams, and he shot a bolt at each of the three blank walls, and the vacuum hissed out at him. The emptiness made an even emptier whistle, a senseless scream. He tried to think about the vacuum upon which the nothingness had performed, but he could not. He held his breath so the vacuum could not get into his lungs. He cut off its terrible emptiness, drew back, and gave the entire room a gift of one huge bright yellow flower of burning. The fireproof plastic sheath on everything was cut wide, and the house began to shudder with flame. When you're quite finished, said Beatty behind him, you're under arrest. The house fell in red coals and black ash. It bedded itself down in sleepy pink gray ciders, and a smoke plume blew over it, rising and waving slowly back and forth in the sky. It was 3.30 in the morning. The crowd drew back into the houses. The great tents of the circus had slumped into charcoal and rubble, and the show was well over. Montag stood with a flamethrower, his limp hands, great islands of perspiration drenching his armpits, his face smeared with soot. The other firemen waited behind him in the darkness, their faces illuminated faintly by the smoldering foundation. Montag started to speak twice and then finally managed to put his thoughts together. Was, was it my wife? turned in the alarm? Beanie nodded, but her friends turned in an alarm earlier. That I let ride. One way or the other, you'd have got it. It was pretty silly, quoting poetry around free and easy like that. It was the act of a silly damn snob. Give a man a few lines of verse and he thinks he's the lord of all creation. You think you can walk on water with your books? Well, the world can get by just fine without them. Look where they got you and slime up to your lip. If I stir the slime with my little finger, you'll drown. Montag could not move. A great earthquake had come with fire and leveled the house, and Mildred was under there somewhere, and his entire life under there, and he could not move. The earthquake was still shaking and falling and shivering inside him, and he stood there, his knees half bent under the great load of tiredness and bewilderment and outrage, letting Beanie hit him without raising a hand. Montag, you idiot. Montag, you damn fool. Why did you really do it? Montag did not hear. He was far away. He was running with his mind. He was gone, leaving this dead, soot-covered body to sway in front of another raving fool. Montag, get out of there, said Faber. Montag listened. Beatty struck him a blow on the head and sent him reeling back. The green bullet in which Faber's voice whispered and cried fell out on the sidewalk. Beatty snatched it up, grinning. He held it half in, half out of his ear. Montag heard the distant voice calling. Montag, are you all right? Beatty switched the green bullet off and thrust it in his pocket. Well, so there's more here than I thought. I saw you tilt your head, listening. First, I thought you had a seashell. But when you turned clever later, I wondered. Well, we'll trace this and drop it on your friend. No, said Montag. He twitched the safety catch on the flamethrower. Beanie glanced instantly at Montag's fingers and his eyes widened the faintest bit. Montag saw the surprise there and himself glanced to his hands to see what new thing they had done.
Thinking back later, he could never decide whether the hands or Beatty's reaction to the hands gave him the final push toward murder. The last rolling thunder of the avalanche stoned down about his ears, not touching him. Beatty grinned his most charming grin. Well, that's one way to get an audience. Hold a gun on a man and force him to listen to your speech. Speech away. What'll it be this time? Why don't you belt Shakespeare at me, you fumbling snob? There is no terror, Cassius, in your threats, for I am armed so strong in honesty that they pass by me as an idle wind, which I respect not. How's that? Go ahead now, you second-hand literature. Pull the trigger. He took one step toward Montag. Montag only said, we never burned right. Hand it over, guy, said Beatty with a fixed smile. And then he was a shrieking blaze, a jumping, sprawling, gibbering mannequin, no longer human or known, all writhing flame on the lawn as Montag shot one continuous pulse of liquid fire on him. There was a hiss like a great mouthful of spittle banging a red hot stove, a bubbling and frothing as if salt had been poured over a monstrous black snail to cause a terrible liqui liquefaction and a boiling over of yellow foam. Montag shut his eyes, shouted, shouted, and fought to get his hands and his ears to clamp and to cut away the sound. Beatty flopped over and over and over, and at last twisted in on himself like a charred wax doll and lay silent. The other two firemen did not move. Montag kept his sickness down long enough to aim the flamethrower. Turn around! They turned, their faces like blanched meat, streaming sweat. He beat their heads, knocking off their helmets and bringing them down on themselves. They fell and lay without moving. The blowing of a single autumn leaf. He turned and the mechanical hound was there. It was half across the lawn, coming from the shadows, moving with such drifting ease that it was like a single solid cloud of black gray smoke blown at him in silence. It made a single last leap into the air, coming down at Montag from a good three feet over his head, its spider legs reaching the procaine needle snapping out of its single angry tooth. Montag caught it with a bloom of fire, a single wondrous bloom that curled in petals of yellow and blue and orange about the metal dog, clad it in a new covering as it slammed into Montag and threw him 10 feet back against the bowl of a tree, taking the flame gun with him. He felt it scrabble and seize his leg and stab the needle in for a moment before the fire snapped the hound up in the air, burst its metal bones at the joints, and blew out its interior in the single flushing of red color like a skyrocket fastened to the street. Montag lay watching the dead, alive thing fiddle in the air and die. Even now, it seemed to want to get back at him and finish the injection, which was now working through the flesh of his leg. He felt all of the mingled relief and horror at having pulled back only in time to have just his knee slammed by the fender of a car, hurtling by at 90 miles an hour. He was afraid to get up, afraid he might not be able to gain his feet at all within Anastai's leg. A numbness and a numbness hollowed into a numbness. And now? The street empty, the house burnt like an ancient bit of stage scenery. The other homes dark, the hound here, beady there. The three other firemen in another place, and the salamander? He gazed at the immense engine. That would have to go too. Well, he thought, let's see how badly off you are. On your feet now, easy, easy, there. He stood and he had only one leg. The other was like a chunk of burnt pine log he was carrying along as a penance for some obscure sin. When he put his weight on it, a shower of silver needles gushed up the length of the calf and went off in the knee. He wept. Come on, come on, you can't, you just can't stay here. A few house lights were going on again down the street, whether from the incidents just passed or because of the abnormal silence following the fight, Montag did not know. He hobbled around the ruins, seized at his bad leg when it lagged, talking and whimpering and shouting directions at it and cursing it and pleading with it to work for him now when it was vital. He heard a number of people crying out in the darkness and shouting. He reached the backyard in the alley, beady, he thought, you're not a problem now. You always said, don't face a problem, burn it. Well, now I've done both. Goodbye, Captain. And he stumbled along the alley in the dark. A shotgun blast went off in his leg every time he put it down and he thought, you're a fool, a damn fool, an awful fool, an idiot, 
an awful idiot, a damn idiot, and a fool, a damn fool. Look at the mess, and where's the mop? Look at the mess, and what do you do? Pride, damn it, and temper, and you've junked it all. At the very start, you vomit on everyone and on yourself. But everything at once, but everything one on top of another. Beatty, the women, Mildred, Clarice, everything. No excuse, though, no excuse. A fool, a damn fool, go give yourself up. No, we'll say what we can. We'll do what there is left to do. If we have to burn, let's take a few more with us. Here, he remembered the books and turned back. Just on the off chance, he found a few books where he had left them, near the garden fence. Mildred, God bless her, had missed a few. Four books still lay hidden where he had put them. Voices were wailing in the night and flash beams swirled about. Other salamanders were roaring their engines far away. The police sirens were cutting their way across town with their sirens. Montag took the four remaining books and hopped, jolted, hopped his way down the alley and suddenly fell as if his head had been cut off and only his body lay there. Something inside had jerked him to a halt and flopped him down. He lay where he had fallen and sobbed, his legs folded, his face pressed blindly to the gravel. Beatty wanted to die. In the middle of crying, Montag knew it for the truth. Beatty had wanted to die. He had just stood there, not really trying to save himself, just stood there, joking, needling, thought Montag, and the thought was enough to stifle his sobbing and let him pause for air. How strange, strange to want to die so much that you let a man walk around armed, and then instead of shutting up and staying alive, you go on yelling at people and making fun of them until you get them mad and then, at a distance, running feet. Montag sat up. Let's get out of here. Come on, get up, get up. You just can't sit. But he was still crying, and that had to be finished. It was going away now. He hadn't wanted to kill anyone, not even Beatty. His flesh gripped him and shrank as if it had been plunged in acid. He gagged. He saw Beatty, a torch, not moving, fluttering out on the grass. He bit at his knuckles. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh God, sorry. He tried to piece it all together to go back to the normal pattern of life a few short days before the sieve and the sand, denim's dentrifice, moth voices, fireflies, the alarms, and excursions. Too much for a few short days, too much indeed for a lifetime. Feet ran in the far end of the alley. Get up, he told himself. Damn it, get up, he said to the leg and stood. The pain were spikes driven in the kneecap and then only darning needles and then only common ordinary safety pins. And after he had dragged along 50 more hops and jumps, filling his hand with slivers from the board fence, the prickling was like someone blowing a spray of scalding water on that leg. And the leg was at last his own leg again. He had been afraid that running might break the loose ankle. Now, sucking all the night into his open mouth and blowing it out pale with all the blackness left heavily inside himself, he set out in a steady jogging pace. He carried the books in his hands. He thought of Faber. Faber was back there in the steaming lump of tar that had no name or identity now. He had burnt Faber too. He felt so suddenly shocked by this that he felt Faber was really dead, baked like a roach in that small green capsule shoved and lost in the pocket of a man who was now nothing but a framed skeleton strung with asphalt tendons. You must remember, burn them or they'll burn you, he thought. Right now, it's as simple as that. He searched his pockets, the money was there, and in his other pocket, he found the usual seashell upon which the city was talking to itself in the cold black morning. Police alert. Wanted. Fugitive in city. Has committed murder and crimes against the state. Name. Guy Montag. Occupation. Fireman. Last scene. He ran steadily for six blocks in the alley, and then the alley opened out to a wide, empty thoroughfare ten lanes wide. It seemed like a boatless river frozen there in the raw light of the high white arc lamps. You could drown trying to cross it. He felt it. It was too wide. It was too open. It was a vast stage without scenery, inviting him to run across, easily seen in the blazing illumination, easily caught, easily shot down. The seashell hummed in his ear. Watch for a man running. Watch for the running man. Watch for a man alone, on foot. Watch. Montag pulled back into the shadows. Directly ahead lay a gas station, a great chunk of porcelain snow shining there, and two silver beetles pulling in to fill up. Now he must be clean and presentable if he wished to walk. 
not run, stroll calmly across that wide boulevard. It would give him an extra margin of safety if he washed up and combed his hair before he went on his way to get... Where? Yes, he thought. Where am I running? Nowhere. There was nowhere to go, no friend to turn to, really, except Faber, and then he realized that he was indeed running toward Faber's house, instinctively. But Faber couldn't hide him. It would be suicide even to try, but he knew that he would go to see Faber anyway for a few short minutes. Faber's would be the place where he might refuel his fast, draining belief in his own ability to survive. He just wanted to know that there was a man like Faber in the world. He wanted to see the man alive and not burned back there like a body shelled in another body. And some of the money must be left with Faber, of course, to be spent after Montag ran on his way. Perhaps he could make the open country and live on or near the rivers and near the highways in the fields and hills. A great whirling whisper made him look to the sky. The police helicopters were rising so far away that it seemed someone had blown down the gray head off a dry dandelion flower. Two dozen of them flurried, wavering, indecisive, three miles off like butterflies, puzzled by autumn, and then they were plummeting down to land, one by one, here, there, softly kneading the streets where, turned back to beetles, they shrieked along the boulevards or, as suddenly leaped back into the air, continuing their search. And here was the gas station, its attendants busy now with customers, approaching from the rear, Montag entered the men's washroom. Through the aluminum wall, he heard a radio voice say, War has been declared. The gas was being pumped outside. The men and the Beatles were talking and the attendants were talking about the engines, the gas, the money owed. Montag stood trying to make himself feel the shock of the quiet statement from the radio, but nothing would happen. The war would have to wait for him to come to it in his personal file an hour, two hours from now. He washed his hands and face and towed himself dry, making little sound. He came out of the washroom and shut the door carefully and walked into the darkness and at last stood on the edge of the empty boulevard. There it lay, a game for him to win, a vast bowling alley in the cool morning. The boulevard was as clean as the surface of an arena two minutes before the appearance of certain unnamed victims and certain unknown killers. The air over and above the vast concrete river trembled with the warmth of Montag's body alone. It was incredible how he felt his temperature could cause the whole immediate world to vibrate. He was a phosphorescent target. He knew it. He felt it. And now he must begin his little walk. Three blocks away, a few headlights glared. Montag drew a deep breath. His lungs were like burning brooms in his chest. His mouth was sucked dry from running. His throat tasted of bloody iron, and there was rusted steel in his feet. What about those lights there? Once you started walking, you'd have to gauge how fast those beetles could make it down here. Well, how far was it to the other curb? It seemed like a hundred yards. Probably not a hundred, but figure for that anyways. Figure that with him going very slowly at a nice stroll, it might take as much as 30 seconds, 40 seconds to walk all the way. The beetles? Once started, they could leave three blocks behind them in about 15 seconds. So even if halfway across he started to run, he put his right foot out and then his left and then his right. He walked on the empty avenue. Even if the street were entirely empty, of course, you couldn't be sure of a safe crossing for a car could appear suddenly over the rise four blocks further on and be on and past you before you had taken a dozen breaths. He decided not to count his steps. He looked neither to the left nor the right. The light from the overhead lamp seemed as bright and revealing as the midday sun and just as hot. He listened to the sound of the car picking up speed two blocks away on his right. Its movable headlights jerked back and forth suddenly and caught at Montag. Keep going. Montag faltered, got a grip on the books and forced himself not to freeze. Instinctively, he took a few quick running steps, then talked out loud to himself and pulled up to stroll again. He was now half across the street, but the roar from the Beatles' engines whined higher as it put on speed. The police, of course, they see me, but slow now, slow, quiet, don't turn, don't look, don't seem concerned. Walk, that's it, walk, walk. The Beatle was rushing, the Beatle was roaring, the Beatle raised its speed, the Beatle was whining, the Beatle was in high thunder, the Beatle came skimming, the Beatle came in a single whistling trajectory, fired from an invisible rifle. It was up to 120 miles per hour. It was up to 130 at least. 
Montag clamped his jaws. The heat of the racing headlights burnt his cheeks, it seemed, and jittered his eyelids and flushed the sour sweat out all over his body. He began to shuffle idiotically and talk to himself, and then he broke and just ran. He put out his legs as far as they could go and down and then far out again and down and back and out and down and back. God, God. He dropped a book, broke pace, almost turned, changed his mind, plunged on, yelling in concrete emptiness, the beetle scuttling after its running foot 200, 100 feet away, 90, 80, 70. Montag gasping, flailing his hands, legs up, down, out, up, down, out, closer, closer, hooting, calling. His eyes burnt white now as his head jerked about to confront the flashing glare. Now the beetle was swallowed in its own light. Now it was nothing but a torch hurtling upon him, all sound, all blare. Now almost on top of him, he stumbled and fell. I'm done. It's over. But the falling made a difference. An instant before reaching him, the wild beetle cut and swerved out. It was gone. Montag lay flat, his head down, wisps of laughter trailed back to him with the blue exhaust from the beetle. His right hand was extended above him, flat. Across the extreme tip of his middle finger, he saw now, as he lifted that hand, a faint sixteenth of an inch of black tread where the tire had touched in passing. He looked at that black line with disbelief, getting to his feet. That wasn't the police, he thought. He looked down the boulevard. It was clear now. A car full of children, all ages, God knew, from 12 to 16, out whistling, yelling, hurrahing, had seen a man, a very extraordinary sight, a man strolling, a rarity, and simply said, let's get him, not knowing he was the fugitive, Mr. Montag, simply a number of children out for a long night of roaring, five or six hundred miles in a few moonlit hours, their faces icy with wind, and coming home or not coming at dawn, alive or not alive, that made the adventure. They would have killed me, thought Montag, swaying, the air still torn and stirring about him in dust, touching his bruised cheek. For no reason at all in the world, they would have killed me. He walked toward the far curb, telling each foot to go and keep going. Somehow he had picked up the spilled books. He didn't remember bending or touching them. He kept moving them from hand to hand as if they were a poker hand he could not figure. I wonder if they were the ones who killed Clarice. He stopped and his mind said it again, very loud. I wonder if they were the ones who killed Clarice. He wanted to run after them, yelling. His eyes watered. The thing that had saved him was falling flat. The driver of that car, seeing Montag down instinctively, considered the probability that running over a body at that speed might turn the car upside down and spill them out. If Montag had remained an upright target, Montag gasped. Far down the boulevard, four blocks away, the beetle had slowed, spun about on two wheels, and was now racing back, slanting over on the wrong side of the street, picking up speed. But Montag was gone, hidden in the safety of the dark alley for which he had set out on a long journey, an hour or was it a minute ago? He stood shivering in the night, looking back out as the beetle ran by and skidded back to the center of the avenue, whirling laughter in the air all about gone. Further on, as Montag moved in darkness, he could see the helicopters falling, falling like the first flakes of snow in the long winter to come. The house was silent. Montag approached from the rear, creeping through a thick night moistened scent of daffodils and roses and wet grass. He touched the screen door and back, found it open, slipped in, moved across the porch, listening. Mrs. Black, are you sleeping there? He thought. This isn't good, but your husband did it to others and never asked and never wondered and never worried. And now, since you're a fireman's wife, it's your house and your turn. For all the houses your husband burned and the people he hurt without thinking. The house did not reply. He hit the books in the kitchen and moved from the house again to the alley and looked back and the house was still dark and quiet, sleeping. On his way across town with the helicopters fluttering like torn bits of paper in the sky, he phoned the alarm at a lonely phone booth outside a store that was closed for the night. Then he stood in the cold night air waiting and at a distance he heard the fire sirens start up and run and the salamanders coming, coming to burn Mr. Black's house while he was sent away at work to make his wife stand shivering in the morning air while the roof let go and dripped in upon the fire. But now she was still asleep. Good night, Mrs. Black, he thought. Faber, another rap, a whisper, and a long waiting. Then after a minute, a small light flickered inside Faber's small house. After another pause, the back door opened. 
They stood looking at each other in the half light, Faber and Mom tagged as if each did not believe in the other's existence. Then Faber moved and put out his hand and grabbed Montag and moved him in and sat him down and went back and stood in the door, listening. The sirens were welling off in the morning distance. He came in and shut the door. Montag said, I've been a fool all down the line. I can't stay long. I'm on my way. God knows where. At least you were a fool about the right thing, said Faber. I thought you were dead. The audio capsule I gave you, burnt. I heard the captain talking to you and suddenly there was nothing. I almost came out looking for you. The captain's dead. He found the audio capsule. He heard your voice. He was going to trace it. I killed him with a flamethrower. Faber sat down and did not speak for a time. My God, how did this happen? Said Montag. It was only the other night. Everything was fine. And the next thing I know, I'm drowning. How many times can a man go down and still be alive? I can't breathe. There's Beatty dead, and he was my friend once, and there's Millie gone. I thought she was my wife, but now I don't know. And the house all burnt, and my job gone, and myself on the run, and I planted a book in a fireman's house on the way. Good Christ, the things I've done in a single week. You did what you had to do. It was coming on for a long time. Yes, I believe that. If there's nothing else, I believe. It saved itself up to happen. I could fill it for a long time. I was saving something up. I went around doing one thing and filling another. God, it was all there. It's a wonder it didn't show on me like fat. And now here I am messing up your life. They might follow me here. I feel alive for the first time in years, said Faber. I feel I'm doing what I should have done a lifetime ago. For a little while, I'm not afraid. Maybe it's because I'm doing the right thing at least. Maybe it's because I've done a rash thing and don't want to look the coward to you. I suppose I'll have to do even more violent things exposing myself so I won't fall down on the job and turn scared again. What are your plans? To keep running. You know that the war is on, I heard. God, isn't it funny, said the old man. It seems so remote because we have our own troubles. I haven't had time to think. Montag drew out a hundred dollars. I want this to stay with you. Use it any way that'll help when I'm gone. But I might be dead by noon. Use this. Faber nodded. You'd better head for the river if you can. Follow along it. And if you can hit the old railroad lines going out into the country, follow them. Even though practically everything's airborne these days and most of the tracks are abandoned, the rails are still there, rest resting. I've heard there are still hobo camps all across the country here and there, walking camps they call them, and if you keep walking far enough and keep an eye peeled, they say there's lots of old Harvard degrees on the tracks between here and Los Angeles. Most of them are wanted and hunted in these cities. They survive, I guess. There aren't many of them, and I guess the government's never considered them a great enough danger to go in and track them down. You might hole up with them for a time and get in touch with me in St. Louis. I'm leaving on the 5 a.m. bus this morning to see a retired printer there. I'm getting out into the open myself at last. The money will be put to good use. Thanks and God bless you. Do you want to sleep a few minutes? No, I'd better run. Let's check. He took Montag quickly into the bedroom and lifted a picture frame aside, revealing a television screen the size of a postal card. I always wanted something very small, something I could talk to. Something I could blot out with the palm of my hand, if necessary. Nothing that could shout me down. Nothing monstrous, big. So you see, he snapped it on. Montag, the TV set said and lit up. M-O-N-T-A-G. The name was spelled out by the voice. Guy Montag, still running. Police helicopters are up. A new mechanical hound has been brought from another district. Montag and Faber looked at each other. Mechanical hound never fells. Never since its first use in tracking quarry has this incredible invention made a mistake. Tonight, this network is proud to have the opportunity to follow the hound by camera helicopter as it starts on its way to the target. Faber poured two glasses of whiskey. We'll need these. They drank. No so sensitive, the mechanical hound can remember and identify 10,000 odor indexes on 10,000 men without resetting. Faber trembled the least bit and looked about at his house, at the walls, the door, the doorknob, and the chair where Montag now sat. Montag saw the look. They both looked quickly about the house, and Montag felt his nostrils dilate, and he knew 
that he was trying to track himself and his nose was suddenly good enough to sense the path he had made in the air of the room and the sweat of his hand hung from the doorknob invisible but as numerous as the jewels of a small chandelier he was everywhere in and on about everything he was a luminous cloud a ghost that made breathing once more impossible he saw faber stop up his own breath for fear of drawing that ghost into his own body perhaps being contaminated with the phantom exhalations and odors of a running man the mechanical hound is now landing by helicopter at the site of the burning and there on the small screen was the burnt house, the crowd and something with a sheet over it and out of the sky fluttering came the helicopter like a grotesque flower. So they must have their gaming out, thought Montag. The circus must go on, even with the war beginning within the hour. He watched the scene, fascinated, not wanting to move. It seemed so remote and no part of him. It was a play apart and separate, wondrous to watch, not without its strange pleasure. That's all for me, you thought. That's all taking place just for me, by God. If he wished, he could linger here in comfort and follow the entire hunt on through its swift phases, down alleys, across streets, over empty running avenues, crossing lots and playgrounds with pauses here or there for the necessary commercials, up other alleys to the burning house of Mr. and Mrs. Black, and so on, finally to this house with Faber and himself seated, drinking, while the electric hound snuffed down the last trail, silent as a drift of death itself, skidded to a halt outside that window there. Then, if he wished, Montag might rise, walk to the window, keep one eye on the TV screen, open the window, lean out, look back, and see himself dramatized. Described, made over, standing there, limbed in the bright small television screen from outside, a drama to be watched objectively, knowing that in other parlors he was large as life and full color, dimensionally perfect. And if he kept his eye peeled quickly, he would see himself an instant before oblivion, being punctured for the benefit of how many civilian parlor sitters who had been awakened from their sleep a few minutes ago by the frantic sirening of their living room walls to come watch the big game, the hunt, the one man carnival. Would he have time for a speech? As the hound seized him, in the view of 10 or 20 or 30 million people, mightn't he sum up his entire life in the last week in one single phrase or word that would stay with him long after the hound had turned, clinching him in its metal plier jaws and trotted off in darkness while the camera remained stationary, watching the creature dwindle in the distance, splendid fade out? What could he say in a single word, a few words, that will sear their faces and wake them up? There, whispered Faber. Out of a helicopter glided something that was not machine, not animal, not dead, not alive, glowing with a pale green luminosity. It stood near the smoking ruins of Montag's house, and the men brought his discarded flamethrower to it and put it down under the muzzle of the hound. There was a whirring, clicking, humming. Montag shook his head and got up and drank the rest of his drink. It's time. I'm sorry about this. About what? Me? My house? I deserve everything. Run, for God's sake. Perhaps I could delay them here. Wait. There's no use your being discovered. When I leave, burn the spread of this bed that I touched. Burn the chair in the living room and your wall incinerator. Wipe down the furniture with alcohol. Wipe the doorknobs. Burn the throw rug in the parlor. Turn the air conditioning on full in and all the rooms and spray with moth spray if you have it. Then turn on your lawn sprinklers as high as they'll go and hose off the sidewalks. With any luck at all, we can kill the trail in here anyway. Faber shook his head. I'll tend to it. Good luck. If we're both in good health next week, the week after, get in touch. General Delivery, St. Louis. I'm sorry, there's no way I can go with you this time by earphone. That was good for both of us, but my equipment was limited. You see, I never thought I would use it. What a silly old man. No thought there. Stupid, stupid. So I haven't another green bullet, the right kind to put in your head. Go now. One last thing, quick, a suitcase, get it, fill it with your dirtiest clothes, an old suit, the dirtier the better, a shirt, some old sneakers, and socks. Faber was gone and back in a minute. They sealed the cardboard ballast with clear tape to keep the ancient odor of Mr. Faber in, of course, said Faber, sweating at the job. Montag doused the exterior of the ballast with whiskey. I don't want that hound picking up two odors at once. May I take this whiskey? I'll need it later. Christ, I hope this works. They shook hands again, and going out of the door, they glanced at the TV. 
The helm was on its way, followed by hovering helicopter cameras silently, silently, sniffing the great night wind that was running down the alley. Goodbye. And Montag was out the back door, lightly, running with a half-empty ballast. Behind him, he heard the lawn sprinkling system jump up, filling the dark air with rain that fell gently, and then with a steady pour all about, washing on the sidewalks and draining into the alley. He carried a few drops of this rain with him on his face. He thought he heard the old man call goodbye, but he wasn't certain. He ran very fast away from the house, down 